Good evening, everybody. This is Friendship Wesleyan Church's Wednesday evening Bible study, 7 p.m. I'm Pastor Kevin Smith. Thank you so much for joining with me this week. I'm assuming that most of you have been on this journey uh, with us in this Bible study um, in the book of Exodus. Let me take us to our slide there. So... Today is August the 24th, and I'm not sure I said that yet, but uh, so the end of August means that summer is fast coming to an end, especially here in Michigan. And uh, so is our uh, Bible study in Exodus going to be ending soon, I think, including this evening. We have three more Bible studies left. And so once again, that's including this evening. And I think our final Bible study is on September 7th. So I have plans for the next one. Want to head back to the New Testament. I like to go back and forth. At least that's somewhat of the pattern that I've been in. And we're going to be doing a Bible study um, beginning on September 14th. So the week after we're done with the Exodus Bible study, we are going to be doing an eight-week Bible study on First and Second Peter. There'll be a reading plan, somewhat like this, and it will be. It's supposed to be sometime soon for you, for you guys online, because we have online and in-house. I don't know if I mentioned that. You're probably aware of that, but anyway, um, it will be on our website sometime very soon, if not today. Um, very soon, and you can go check out that reading plan. Just eight weeks to cover both First and Second Peter, but that will take us in to the beginning of November. So um, back to the next slide where we're at this evening. Make sure I don't click on the wrong thing. So grab a Bible, open up to Exodus chapter 31, and uh, we're going to be working through 33 verse uh, 23 this evening, but as always, we want to uh, begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful this evening for the breath of life, and uh, your word has given us clarity and direction, everything that has breath to praise you. So, Father, here, our hunger for your word tonight is an act of worship, adoration, and praise. We want to know you. So, Father, guide and direct us. Um, I almost said, Father, like to invite you, but, Father, we know there is nowhere that we can flee from your presence. So, the invitation is that we open our hearts, we open our minds to the influence of your spirit, that as we walk in your word tonight, you will teach us, Father, exactly what you want us to know. Reveal to us um, your will and, uh, Father, that uh, that application piece in our lives of uh, what it means, uh, your word, and how it applies to our lives. We trust in you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, so last week we spent our time, if you got your Bibles, we spent much of our time in chapter 30. You know how it is. Matter of fact, I got to tell you, our uh, our text tonight, you know, I usually say that I, I, I have places I want to get and then I don't get there. So uh, where I ended up, I, I, I'm a bit frustrated because I unpacked and unpacked and unpacked and could not unpack everything in the portion of text we're going to hang out on. But uh, anyway, last week we spent the bulk of our time uh, in chapter 30 on the uh, census, the atonement money is where we spend our time. So remember, just a reminder, uh, Moses is still on the mountain with God. God is still giving directions and guidelines for the people. We have the commandments, we have some civil laws, moral law designed for the tabernacle, the priesthood, and so on and so forth. And so Tonight, we're about to come down off the mountain. Moses is about to uh, come off the mountain, and it isn't um, it, it, it isn't going to be good. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, there's, there's some bad things 
that are going to happen. Matter of fact, chapter 31, verse 18, this is kind of our transition verse here. When the Lord had finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, uh, we'll come back to it again, but if you remember right, Moses spent how long? 40 days, 40 nights on the mountain. We're coming to the end of that. He gave him two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. So I thought I'd be spending the bulk of my, I'll scan the text uh, ahead of the Bible study, ahead of my work, and I get an idea for where I'm going to probably end up. In this text, I thought for sure I was going to end up in uh, 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 31 verses uh, 12 uh, through uh, 18, the the Sabbath. I That's just such an important topic to me. I've learned so much about it in recent years that my initial impression was that we were going to be spending um, most of our time there. Um, these are the final instructions, remember, the, the, the final instructions before God is done speaking to Moses. And uh, so the Sabbath is kind of final instruction. instructions here. I want to read some of it because uh, I want you to grasp the, the seriousness of this business with the Sabbath. Verse 12, chapter 31, verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for generations to come, so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it is to be put to death. That's repeated then. The uh, the death sentence is repeated a second time in that text. So hopefully you can kind of feel and sense that's pretty serious business. So, you know, where's the Sabbath in our lives today? Where does it happen? And where do we go from a death sentence to where we are today? But I'm wetting your appetite there, and we're not going to spend our time there. So remember Wednesday nights, it's all about um, getting a little taste so that each one of us individually go and spend that extra time to dig deeper um, into uh, God's word. So let me make a few comments first, hopefully to bridge where we're headed. Um, and then we'll get to where I want to spend, where I ended up spending most of my time in study. So I want to read chapter 31, 1 through 6, 4. You know, some we talk Wednesday nights, we talk about observation, interpretation, application. <clears throat> Sometimes application is staring you in the face. Um, and I think in this case, it, there there is an, a quick application in a very simple uh, text. I mean, God is, I think, encouraging Moses to know that all this stuff that he's given to Moses to build, to do, to put in place, that he will equip the people so that Moses won't have to worry about having um, the right people in the right places to do the work. So listen to this, chapter 31, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. Moreover, I have appointed Oholiab, son of Hisamach, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, listen to this, also I have given ability to all the skilled workers to make everything I have commanded you. So Moses at that point must be kind of like, ooh, breathing a sigh of relief as God's giving him these incredible details. And Moses is a doer. He tends to do a lot of things on his own to accomplish them. Must be at this point that Moses is grateful for the promise of God. So here's the application, quick application, right? Um, God will give you the abilities to do uh, that you need to do his will, to accomplish his will in your life. Matter of fact, there is clear New Testament scripture and text and application here. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, 
pastors and teachers, teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And this is all the question of the gifts of the spirit. Um, uh, teaching on that generally says each follower of Christ has at least one gift um, to do the work of the Lord, to do what God calls us to do. So just a quick uh, application from simple text, okay? Um, most of my study, however, should have, I shouldn't have totally gotten out of my uh, slide presentation, but most of, or, or the rest of our time, I think all of it now, is going to be spent on this whole story of the golden calf. So I was going to go to the Sabbath, right? And then, uh, but I knew I had to work through the golden calf story and then come back to the Sabbath. I never got out of the golden calf um, story, chapter 32, where I'm going to read some of it for you in just a moment. Um, and I think the deal is, is as you read through this, you know, I've talked before, like, I like, okay, where are the questions in the text that cause me to want to dig deeper? And this story uh, begs a lot of questions. And that's why I said I unpacked and still could not get to the bottom of all of it. One of my favorite images from this story is uh, here. This is that uh, Ten Commandments movie, Charlton Heston. This is just a single slide out of that moment. By the way, the uh, that word in the text, did a little reading on the word for calf. And uh, many scholars uh, agree that the uh, word for calf is not translated well, that that probably signified at least a three-year-old bull. And uh, so the image, I'm not sure what this is, but that image where you see calves, um, it probably was, a, the image was of an older uh, bull. Um, and so let's let's read some of this. And then, because we're just going to read like six verses and you're going to, the questions are going to come pouring out for us. And I'm going to start with the biggest one on my mind. But you think of your questions as, as I read. So Moses is about to come down off the mountain. Chapter 32, verse 1, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, how long was he? We'll come back to that. They gathered around Aaron and said, um, let me go back for emphasis and make sure you catch this. They gathered around Aaron and said, come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Wow. Um, and we haven't even come close to unpacking this, this whole story. But let's start with some of my big questions. The biggest question for me really is about is Aaron. You know, how does Aaron end up giving into this insanity and evil? I mean, our Aaron up to this point, he's Moses' brother, right? Older brother, um, widely believed. I think it's in the scriptural text, three years older than Moses. He's the first in the line of high priest, the Levitical priesthood, so God's chosen people to lead in worship. He, he's been with Moses from the beginning. Aaron is the one that was chosen to be the spokesperson. So those images of <clears throat> Moses before Pharaoh and then the 10 
bat battles, uh, struggles with Pharaoh, the eventual plague of the firstborn and the leaving of Egypt, you know, Aaron had the front row seat, leadership seat. Um, and so um, it's like, what happened? You know, how does this happen? <clears throat> and then there's another question that goes along with it. Why wasn't Aaron punished? And we didn't read the punishment portion of this text. And let's look at a couple of them right now. But um, and, and then I'll come back to the fact that we don't really find anywhere in the text where um, Aaron gets punished for this evil. So chapter 32, let's go over to, to verse 27. Um, let me read this for you. This is actually a punishment inflicted by Moses um, on the people. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says, each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. And that in and of itself, we are going to unpack that a little bit, but that that whole thing in and of itself, that's one of those places where people go, how could that happen? Is that in the Bible? You know, what kind of a God allows that to happen? So we're going to unpack that a little bit, but that's a punishment. And then God adds a punishment. If you go over to verse 35, and the Lord struck the people, so 32, 35, and the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. So we still get Aaron as a huge culprit leadership in this, right? But if you read through the entirety of the text, if you did, you'll find there, there's no real evidence that Aaron was punished. So the first thing is, how does Aaron end up leading? And I'll, it, it's definitely a sin of leadership. Um, how does Aaron end up leading this sinfulness. And you know, Moses Moses asks the same question of Aaron. If you look at chapter 32, verse, oh, let me see here, verse 27. Um, yeah, then he said, um, no, messed up there. Oh, okay. 32, 21, go back up to verse 21, staring me right in the face. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such a great sin. And so Moses wanted the answer to the same question. Now, listen to Aaron's response, because this is going to teach us a little about his sinful act. Do not be angry, verse 22, my Lord. Verse 22, do not be angry, my Lord. Aaron answered, you know how prone these people are evil. So who did he first blame it on? <laughs> They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what was ha has happened to him. Now who's he blaming on? So I told them, whoever has any gold, jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold and I threw it. Listen to this. I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. Pop. <laughs> it's just... Aaron didn't do it. It just happened. And uh, wow. Um, as a matter of fact, that last piece, I wanted to unpack that a little bit. We're not going to, we're not going to unpack that, that piece or Aaron saying, Oh, it just appeared um, out of the fire. So Aaron blames the people, right? It's the first thing he did. If you notice that he blames Moses, Moses failure to return. As a matter of fact, if you go back to chapter 24, I said, we will talk about this again. But if you flip back to chapter 24 and look at verse 28, the uh, excuse me, verse 18. Did I actually have verse? Um, yeah, I had the wrong verse there. But verse 18, then Moses entered the cloud as he went up the mountain and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Um, wow. After this event, Moses is going to do another 40 days or 40 nights. We're not going to uh, get into that. But uh so anyway, so uh, Aaron blames the people. He he he's saying the people were looking for Moses, but it's it's me. I didn't read anywhere. I just I think he's blaming Moses too. You took so long, uh, you know, to come down. What was I supposed to do? And then he blames the fire, right? And it 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 came out of 
uh, this this fire. So how do we understand what's going on here with Aaron? There's some key verses in this text um, that help us understand. So if you look at 32, verse 4. So let's go back to that. 32, verse 4. Um, we did read this. He took what they handed him. This is Aaron, right? He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods. And actually a lot of translations, it's singular, it's not plural, says this is your God. Aaron, Aaron basically said to him, this is your God. Um, either way, the implication is still the same. Here, Aaron seems to take the position, this is on them. This is your gods, not me. I'll do this for you because um, whatever the reason, but this 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 is not my doing. This is your doing. That's pretty telling. And then verse, notice verse five. This, this is really strange. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. Did he really do that? So he's, he's taken this image, this pagan God image, and he's going to uh, consecrate it. He's going to uh, dedicate it to the Lord, right? Uh, uh, a festival to the Lord. They're going to be a party to the Lord. It almost makes me wonder if he's like, okay, God, it probably shouldn't be doing this, but if I include you, are we okay here? You know, are we good? What are we going to do with these people? And um, so, and that that was just kind of like spontaneous. I don't actually have that as a response um, in in my uh, notes. But so here he's trying to include God. And I think these verses tell us something about where Aaron is and how this happened. So um, as a matter of fact, I did some homework here because when you see that, like I see uh, capital L-O-R-D, do other translations have that? And is that literally, was he using the Hebrew name of God there? Did he really mean God or is this translation Im implying that they think that? So listen, all the translations have capital L on the word Lord. That's the first thing I noticed. Then I went to the Hebrew word and sure enough, let me, let me show you here. Sure enough, the word in Hebrew that's used here, Yahweh, Jehovah or Yahweh, it's also pronounced, is the word that um, Aaron uses. That Moses, remember, Moses wrote the first five books that Moses records that Aaron uses. And uh, so, um, wow, I think that um, well, one of the things happening here, one of the first thoughts at the top of my mind was, in front of my mind, was he's obviously giving in to peer pressure and trying to build where excuses can be made later, which he actually does, right? So these, these verses we just went over, you can see this process of him potentially going, mm, don't know if I should do this, so I'm going to include some excuses for later if if uh, need be. And, you know, I thought to, this was another thought I didn't read anywhere in commentaries, but remember they've been in Egypt, and um, Egypt worship. Uh, they're polytheists who worship multiple gods. And so I'm just wondering if that was another thing. Either Aaron was going, well, you know, these people have been influenced. This is the way they understand it. So I'm going to use this pagan stuff to, um, or if maybe Aaron was feeling a little sense of doubt with everything that was happening and taking place. Matter of fact, one commentary, let me read this for you. One commentary basically says, that this was this was not consciously done. Listen, this shows that, speaking of the calf thing, this shows that the creation and the worship of the golden calf was not a conscious rejection of the Lord. Aaron and the rest of Israel probably thought they could give honor to the Lord through the golden calf. Aaron was not crass enough to say, let's do away with the Lord God. As Israel saw, Aaron didn't take away the Lord God, he simply added the golden calf. And maybe <laughs> that's some of what was happening anyway. Um, but I don't think in any way we're lightening the fact or taking away from the fact that Aaron did make a very sinful choice in this case. 
And here's what I think it comes down to. Simple little phrase. Let me say it to you. Aaron doubted God and was afraid of the people. And when you doubt God and fear people, <laughs> trouble is crouching at your door. And you know what it made me think? Could happen to anyone. We're, um, you know, and I thought that. I thought, well, I said it could happen to anyone. We're saying that. And then I, I kind of added a descriptor to it. Um, anyone that lets distance happen in their relationship with the Lord, um, it, it can happen. But so here's, here's so, so Aaron, sinfulness, um, uh, listen more to the people that of God. But remember that God is working with broken. Um, if you've been with me on our studies, Genesis, Exodus, uh, now Exodus and through our uh, biblical studies in the Old Testament, one of the things we're learning together is that from the fall in the garden, now God's dealing with broken, broken people always. We could take any of the names of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph. We could take uh, Moses. Um, you give me a name, we'll give you some brokenness, right? Um, because God was dealing with um, broken. So we need to remember that. So I think that gives us some understanding as to how he ended up responding this way, leading people in this evil. So let's talk about for a few moments about why wasn't Aaron punished. Um, and let me just quickly point out, now we're jumping verse to verse, not reading the whole story. So you have to go back, read the whole story. But if you look at 32, 26, um, before that horrible story of 3,000 people being put to death. In verse 26, listen, this is Moses. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. So there was an opportunity for repentance, for decision-making. The crazy thing is that some people didn't come to the side of the Lord. Do you notice that? So that's before that verse 27, when we get into that horrible story of people being uh, put to death. Aaron was no doubt in that group that came over to the side of the Lord and 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 actually had an act of repentance here um, in this part of the story. Still, there should have been some sort of punishment, right? But And then I want to point something else that's in another Old Testament. It's in the... Um, it's still in the book of law in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 20. This is Deuteronomy, Moses' account in Deuteronomy um, of this same story. And he's talking about himself, and he says in verse 20 of, of chapter 9, And the Lord was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him, but at the time I prayed for Aaron too. So Moses, we're going to talk about this in a minute. Moses interceded for the people, and he interceded for Aaron. So it becomes obvious that Aaron was a part of this answered prayer on Moses' behalf or interceding with people. And Moses stood in for him. And so apparently Aaron avoided some punishment. But listen to me, there's there's two other kind of responses. There's probably even more. But uh, to if we truly knew the whole realm of the whole story, we had time to unpack it all. But the first thing is, when you know the whole of Aaron's story and the whole of his life, you could say that it appears that there was punishment yet to come in Aaron's life. He didn't have a beautiful, wonderful life in always after this. Um, it, it almost could be concluded that Aaron was punished. Um, his two oldest sons, it's a terrible story. They sin in the tabernacle. They're, they're uh, in the priesthood also, and they're in the tabernacle, and they're both consumed with fire for their sin in the tabernacle. Let me show you the text here, um, that top text, which is hard for me to see right now. Oh, there we go. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his commands. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. They died before the Lord. So Aaron's two sons, I believe they were the oldest, are uh, consumed by fi fire. And then Aaron, and I know these are these are other situations, but once again, I'm simply saying that um, uh, Aaron... Um, did have forms of punishment in his life that happened later. And it, it could possibly be said 
that punishment did happen. Um, and then um, the end of his life, Aaron dies in the wilderness and never makes it to the promised land. Numbers chapter 20, at Mount Hor near the border of Edom, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Aaron will be gathered to his people. He will not enter the land. I gave the Israelites because both of you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. So it's another situation, but it, it, do, it does make you wonder a little bit if maybe in the back of God's mind, if you can use that kind of language for God, but somewhere in there still not. Uh, Aaron's disobedience is leading the people. Um, Aaron wouldn't have said that. Aaron was saying they led him, but um, Aaron's leading the people into rebellion, and Moses gave him credit for having led the people. So I, I think a big application here is don't don't doubt God and be careful fearing people. Don't fear people. So that whole piece of his life did kind of reflect the punishment. And then just want to point out to you, remember that Aaron had been chosen for the priesthood. The priesthood had been chosen. And then Aaron um, uh, is chosen, Exodus chapter 28, uh, verse 1. And this is just the character of God I want to point out to you. So 28.1, have Aaron, your brother, brought to you from among the Israelites, along with his sons, Nadab and Abihu, Abihu there they are, Eliezer and Ethamar, so they may serve me as priests. So before the situation, Aaron is chosen. Remember, I've said, I'm going to say it again, God is working with broken. What priest God would have chosen would not have been susceptible to sin. Like I said, we can go through the patriarchs. We can go through, we've talked about this before in our Old Testament studies. Um, matter of fact, it made me think this is probably why I was talking with some uh, other students of the Bible uh, this past week about this very situation. We were talking about the priesthood and all the rules at the tabernacle, even for the high priest, the cleansing rules and everything to get into the Holy of Holies. And I thought this is why the rules were there, right? Because even this priest, I don't know what we think. We hear high priests and we think they're perfect. Um, right. Only Jesus, right? He was the, the right, the perfect, the only one able to save us because he was the sinless high priest. Um, and so any priest would have been susceptible to sin and, uh, and cleansing before Aaron would go into the Holy of Holies was all meant as a message to their sinfulness. And so the, the application is, uh, our sinfulness and God's mercy. Right here in the Old Testament, it's about our sinfulness and God's mercy, The big one of the big messages of the Bible. So this is, I've mentioned this, and I kind of want to start bringing it home now um, and conclude our time together for us, but um, this is one of those places I'm so impressed by Moses' intercessions. If, you, if you've I've been through this whole Bible study. We've talked about this already. Um, Moses was really connected with God in communication. And talk about power in prayer and being able to connect with God's mercy. And this is one of those other places, okay? Uh, 32, go to verse 9, chapter 32, verse 9, and watch what unfolds here, right? I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Now, I think a lot of human beings would have gone, you know, I'm not messing with God. He's mad. It's justice. They deserve punishment and stayed silent and taken, you know, although um, it would have shown that Moses wasn't, the godly kind of man we know he was. But right here, uh, God says, and I'll make you a great nation. And Moses, okay, I'm good. Wipe him out. Start start over with me. He doesn't do that. He uh, Verse 11, but Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. By the way, if you think those first things meant to Moses that God wasn't a favorable or merciful God, one of the reasons that Moses go, goes ahead and steps forward here probably in some fear and trembling, is because he knows God's merciful and God is loving and forgiving. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people 
whom you brought up out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Now I got to stop here for a minute. There's a funny thing here. We didn't read the whole text. If you go back to uh, verse seven, which we didn't read, um, the Lord's uh, going to speak. He's speaking to Moses here and he says, listen to what the Lord says. Now Moses just said, your people and your, uh, that you brought out of Egypt, but God had already said to Moses, verse seven, then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. I, I read this and it sounds like parents, you ever been there, parents with the naughty child, your son, your daughter. And I got a chuckle out of this, but I'll tell you, it actually wasn't humorous at all like that. It wasn't a conversation like that at all. Actually, it wasn't that kind of humor, although maybe God, I think sometimes, because I know he has a sense of humor, laughs at these things that look a certain uh, way to us. But um, actually, when God says to Moses, your people and you brought out of Egypt, that was a message to Moses that he was ready. He was done with them. He, he was done with them. Um, the they'd broken the covenant already with God. They'd been disobe disobedience, horrific pagan immorality here beyond our thoughts. If we'd have been there, if we would have been repulsed, disgusted, angry, whatever. But um, so this was a message from God that the covenant was broken and he could in his righteousness and justice be done with the people. So he says, um, your people. Moses, your people, wasn't like, they're not mine. They're not mine. I don't want nothing to do with them. And it was a plea for God's mercy and his grace. Um, watch what he says there. He says, you brought them out of Egypt with great power and mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains, to wipe them off the face of the earth? Uh, Yahweh, Jehovah, you're a good God. You didn't bring them out here to kill them. You didn't, you didn't bring, turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, <coughs> and Israel, to whom you swore uh, by your own self, I will make your descendants as nu numerous and take them to the promised land. So Moses is leaning into and pleading on uh, God's mercy. And of course, I think God knew exactly how this was going to play out. And Moses needed to stand in the gap. I've said this before when we came across this. Kind of really makes you think about today, praying for those who are lost, who don't know Jesus, and uh, praying for the world today in love and mercy and asking God um, to be merciful. What if we're not standing in the gap like Moses did? What if we're not doing the interceding that God expects and wants from us? To do so, I think that's um, uh, really important and big stuff. Let's see. Yeah, um, verse fourteen. We can't. We have to finish with that. Then the Lord relented, did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. And some of you remember that conversation. Um, there was A and B. Um, both were righteous and just. God to wipe people out or to be merciful. And Moses stood in the gap and and asked for. Um, that other righteous decision to be merciful to the people at his own, you know, Moses, um, you know, God, I'll start over with you. We'll get rid of the people. And Moses um, steps in the gap for him. So um, I couldn't leave without returning for a few moments to this whole thing of the 3000 people being put to death. Verses 27, 28 of chapter 32, um, which I actually think we read already. So I'm not going to um, rehash that story. You can go back and reread it. And let me just throw some thoughts out to you about that because it's one of those places I talked to staff about it. it seems horrible. It seems uh, tough to understand how God would let something like that happen. But that is where we kind of misunderstand. We, we filter through where we are, present moment circumstances. Let me point some things out to you. First of all, remember the people were given an opportunity to repent. In that verse preceding it, Moses gave them the opportunity to come over the other side. These people hadn't done that, right? So they were unrepentant. Um, God was going to put them to death up here. This is why I said this is kind of justice system, the civil justice system, the judges and Moses that had enacted this system we talked about. Now it comes into play. 
And uh, because God relented over here and Moses is going to make sure that justice is done. Um, so the, and these 3000, remember we're talking up to 2 million people. I think some have said, so 3000 people, we're talking about a small group of people, remnant of people. It's a lot to put to death, but a remnant of people. And these people would have undoubtedly been the ringleaders for this situation that took place. Um, and if we would have been there, the flagrant acts of immorality and idolatry, I don't even want to explain to you what they were doing. We couldn't, we wouldn't be able to say those things. These were not nice people that just innocently made a mistake. It was horrific what they were doing. And if you and I were judges at the time, we would have been severe in our punishment and judgment. And I think, and this is one of the things, and we're gonna close with this that I wanted to explain, I was talking with staff about, that when you think about it, I, it's so hard for us to really realize the mess we have ourselves in. Um, I think we think of ourselves um, better off than the mess that really exists, right? Um, we don't get God's holiness and we don't get our sinfulness. We don't get that. So I was talking with staff about that the other day. And I said, imagine for a moment you're in God's throne room in the kingdom of heaven. And this is kind of like going back to Garden of Eden. Because in the Garden of Eden, before the fall, there was right relationship with God. It was good, right? We're not dealing with that anymore, right? We live in the brokenness and the sinfulness. But you go into God's throne room into his eternal kingdom in heaven. No more sorrow, no more suffering, no more death, no more sin. You know, no more of those things, you know. And so whatever sin, whatever mistake, whatever, what what's the, the deserving punishment in heaven? So the smallest of sin in heaven, it, it makes it here. It, then it's not heaven. Then it's not, then it's not and, and it's not here. It, then it becomes here and we would have no hope. Here is the sinfulness and the brokenness. And so here's the deal. It was decided in righteousness that the just penalty for sin, any sin, was death. Okay? So just for the wages of sin is death. And so we need to understand that God is righteous and holy and just. So now when you think about him interacting with us here, being patient with Aaron, who created or committed such an egregious, egregious wrong, he repented um, and sin. Um, and then the patriarchs and then the patience and love and mercy he has for you and me. Now we begin to get a glimpse of the situation we're really in, where God is loving, merciful, forgiving, and kind. And we see punishments in the scriptures. We need to understand the seriousness to a righteous and holy judge about this sin. And the cool thing is, this is all what Jesus is about. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus is the only one that could have brought you and me to the kingdom and then given us eternal hope that we'll be eternally in heaven without sin, without sorrow, without death, without brokenness. There's our application. Trust that God will bless you for it this evening. So next week, let me share the final slide here for you. Next week, we're going to be doing Exodus 34, 1 through 37, 16. Don't forget, that's our next to the last study. And then we're going to begin our study, First and Second Peter. When you get a chance, go check out our website. Go to the Wednesday night materials and download that reading plan. Um, and then every week, I also show you what's coming next. So if you can't do that for some reason, you'll be able to get them from week to week. Let me close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you are righteous, you are holy, you are sinless, you are perfect, you are judge. And Father, in your righteousness, in your holiness, the just punishment for sin was death, but your gift to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, was eternal life. Thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness. We don't come like we could be Jesus and be perfect, but we come before you, Father, um, confessing our sin and trusting in your mercy and your grace through your son, Jesus. Um, it is faith that has saved us 
And then, Father, we know that that salvation works in our hearts to create good works. And so today, Father, we want to serve you in whatever way you see fit. Guide and lead us. Lead us to people that need Jesus. Bless each and every one that's watched this evening, Father, with the presence of your Spirit to serve you in righteousness and justice and holiness. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Thanks for joining with me this week. I'll see you next week um, or Sunday morning. Have a God week.